Britain's Prime Minister is sharing his vision on how the UK should deal with a threat posed by the bloodthirsty Islamic State group that's operating in Iraq and Syria. Artis Minakosrova, listen to his speech to MPs. It appears that it's all about giving British authorities and the police more power. David Cameron outlined his strategy in defeating the Islamic State, and he believes to prevent Brits from going abroad to travel alongside extremists and to prevent those who already have from coming back, he would have to give more powers to police officers at the border to confiscate passports. And in case the court decides to challenge him, he is considering creating new legislation to give the parliament the power to decide that over the court. Next, he wants British authorities to have enhanced use of exclusion zones or relocation powers. This is also something that will be debated. And in general, David Cameron is responding to increased fears in the country over the widespread reach that the Islamic State has. Now, according to a recent poll by YouGov, some 67 percent of Brits support, in fact, the UK government to confiscate passports of those who are suspected to be members of the Islamic State. State. And of course, their fears are further exacerbated over the, of course, the slaughter of soldier Lee Rigby in London, the beheading of American journalists by suspected British jihadists. And in fact, 500 of them have already known to have traveled to Iraq and Syria. Around half of them are already back. So the danger and the threat is real, and the Brits here feel it. And the poll, of course, shows the results of that. And of course, the latest revelation the fact that one of the Islamic State's key financiers was, in fact, the director of a Muslim faith school right here in the UK in the city of Birmingham. And the fears here are shared by Brits. They're also shared by other European citizens and the leaders of those countries. As you can see now on your screen, everyone is saying that the Islamic State poses a direct threat to every single European country. Causing a lot of concern in Britain right now. Let's get some more comment from political and social commentator Mohammed Ansi. He's in Britain. He's in Southampton on the south coast there. Sir, thanks for being with us. Um, some are concerned that these drastic measures, some will call them drastic measures, being um, proposed by the Prime Minister could lead to innocent people being uh, denied access back into Britain again. Do you share that worry? I think that's a worry that's been echoed um, across the chamber and also been uh, echoed by civil liberties organisations who are worried about the firstly the fact that we have this uh, uh, return of, of uh, control orders and TPIMs. I think, but before even we get to that stage, people are wondering how, when somebody's returning from Syria or from the Middle East, are we going to assess whether they've been involved in any kind of uh, radicalisation, any kind of terrorism, or have in fact been fighting as jihadis? Well, I suppose um, the Prime Minister, the police would say they've uh, maybe been under surveillance, they've got information on them anyway. I suppose there's filter processes. Um, why has this seemingly caught the British government off guard, this threat from ISIS, from radicalisation? It seems to have caught so many people off guard. Couldn't they have seen this coming? I'm not sure it has necessarily caught the British government off guard. I think the problem has been that our... Uh, policy on counter-radicalization and counter-extremism has uh, ostensibly failed. Uh, I mean, it failed to intercept uh, the Woolwich killers, it, it failed around 7-7, it's continued to fail, seeing people who are under surveillance going overseas to fight uh, as they see it in an ideological, in an intellectual, a spiritual jihad overseas. So we, at the minute, have a, a domestic policy uh, which is centred around the Home Office, which is mired in controversy. We have the likes of uh, Secretary of State for Education, Michael Gove, organisations like the Quilliam Foundation, who are involved more in sycophancy and self-interest than dealing with the threat of radicalisation. If we want to get back to the heart of radicalisation, we need to look at what's going on in communities, and we really need to reinstate some of that drastically cut uh, funding, which was taken out as we hollowed out community programmes which are tackling these threats. I mean, it's one thing to be unhappy where you live in life, um, to be maybe not having a job. Yeah, having a hard, tough time, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to uh, drive you to go want to go abroad and chop British people's heads off, though, does it? What's causing this, this real no, deep emotion? Question, well, the, the, the question really is what is causing young British Muslims to turn to radical and twisted ideal, ideologies about their own faith? When you look at the British uh, Muslim social profile, you see 80% are on or below the poverty lines. They're at the harshest end when it comes to welfare cuts, welfare reforms. Now, this isn't in any way to create a, 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 you know, an apologism for, 
for, for the, their likes of their crimes. But when we alienate young people, when we see the return of the banlieue or the ghettoization of, of black and ethnic minority groups and, and the mm. fast growing, incredibly young British Muslim population, it's not hard to see how these marginalized groups who are so poorly educated on Islam and actually what our British values turning to the wrong kind of message. I got you. Okay, Mohammed, thanks for your time. Mohammed Ansar, their political and uh, social commentator on the line from Southampton. Appreciate it.